Good morning, Mr. Cavender. Good morning. Um, you can assume that we have read uh, everything which is relevant, and um, you'll be aware that this uh, uh, has a time limit of two hours. So. My lady, yes, I'm obliged. Uh, good, good morning, my ladies. Um, I appear for the claimants on this application for permission to appeal against the order of Mr. Simon Gleeson, sitting as a deputy local judge, uh, dated 11th of January 2023, uh, where he dismissed the claim uh, for damages due to the to the sale of the Chardin. Obviously, you're aware of that, having read the papers. My only friend, Henry Lakin's counsel, appears for the defendant. Now, my lady, uh, Lady Justice Falk, looked at the, this application on the papers. Uh, and um, by way of general summary, summary indicated that uh, she considered that the points were, were argued. Uh, but um, you had a number of questions about rising out of your consideration, my learned friend's uh, responsive note. So I'm going to proceed, if it's uh, satisfactory to the court, to deal with those points uh, raised by my, my lady and any other points the court wants to raise. Obviously, you, you will ask us as we go through if that is satisfactory. So dealing with, uh, without further ado, with ground one, ground one focuses on what the defendant had an obligation to do under the mandate. And as my lady, uh, Lady Justice Falk remarked, it's really that the judge paid insufficient attention to the terms on which the painting was delivered to the defendant, which is a fair way of summarising uh, that ground. Uh, the way the matter was dealt with by the judge was that the defendant did act in accordance with the reasonable skill and care obligation as, as outlined in, in Thompson. And, and that's the way he proceeded. And we say, standing back from ground one, is the mistake was not only to apply Thompson, which considered the duty of disclosure owed by an auction house in a very different situation, but he also failed to recognise what the mandate required the defendant to do. Can you show us in the particulars of claim where you pleaded what the mandate was. My lady, yes. Can I, can I come to that in a moment? Um, but but the, 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 that is a point my learned friend raises. It's mm -hmm. a point I'm going to deal with. Um, it was, we say, that mandate which framed the scope of the reasonable care, i.e. answering the duty to do what? Now, the basis upon which the painting was entrusted to the defendant was clearly an issue in the case, and the judge recognised this. If one goes to the judgment, paragraph uh, 79. Mm -hmm. He says, it is clear that the precise details of the duties owed by Dickinson should be governed by the terms <coughs> of the contract between them and the Weems. Unfortunately, the terms of that agreement are forever lost in time and can only be inferred from the evidence. So he says that there. And then at paragraph 106, on the same theme, he says something rather different, uh, six lines down. His mandate from them was simply to obtain the best price reasonably obtainable for the paintings given to him for that purpose. So um, the, the problem is, we say, the judge never really properly focused on this point uh, and, and failed to do so in circumstances where there clearly was, and I'll take you to the passages, on his findings, a mandate to clean and assess with a view to possible sale. And that would necessarily involve reporting back to the claimants on the complicated provenance on its effect on price and upon their options. Only then could they decide whether to sell. And it was that advice that should have been given and which was indisputably not given. Now, one of my learned friend's points and my lady, Lady Justice Falk's queries was this was a new point. In my submission, it clearly wasn't a new point. All I do in the grounds is to ask for a more careful focus to be placed on a, an existing point. The, uh, the point was uh, squarely raised at the uh, trial. If one goes to the uh, supplemental bundle 2, tab 
3. Paragraph 14, 16. Sorry, can you give me a page number? Yes, it's page 86, my lady. Behind tab 3. So what you see in paragraph 14 is the second sentence. The painting was sent for cleaning, research, and the decision to be made as to what should be done with it. That reflects very much the point in ground one, uh, and what should be happened to have it uh, cleaned. 14.2, to inform sees of the outcome of the cleaning, research, and consideration of the painting. 14.4, uh, to advise them of the options open to them, inc including how to improve the attribution if required. The painting was to be sold. What was it to be sold as and for how much? The risk that any uncertain attribution could be incorrect, financial implications, in terms of the price could be obtained. <coughs> so the, that is the case that was run. And that is the case you see there in the, um, in the, in the final submissions. And then at 15, um, it records none of this appears to be disputed. When the wider duties were put to the defendant's witnesses, uh, they were accepted. And you see then under evidence, with references, that uh, Maloney Friends uh, uh, expert accepted that there was a duty, for instance, to inform of the outcome of the cleaning research. <clears throat> and over the page, there was a duty to advise on the possibility of consulting an expert, etc. Mr. Cavender, the heading that precedes this, page 85, is about scope of duty, which I understand to be the scope of the duty of care. As I understand the case ran at, ran at trial, to the extent these points came up, they came up as aspects of the duty of care. Well, my lady, I, I have to accept there, was, there wasn't, if you like, a bright line that said, well, these are the duties in contract, these are the duties in, in, uh, uh, under, the, uh, under the, the negligence, reasonable care. They, they, they morphed one into the other. They weren't separately and distinctly dealt with. That, that is so. But, it, but the distinction is quite important, I think, because the way you frame ground one is straightforwardly that the judge disregarded the terms of the mandate. Yet, the way I, and we haven't gone to the pleadings yet, but the way I read at least the start of section three of these closing submissions is all talking about the scope of the duty of care. Milady, so certainly it, it is in that context. It, it's not. Right. It's not dealt with separately. But that that is so. And nor is it in the pleading. Indeed. I mean, we can go to the pleading, the pleading now, Milady, to to deal with your. As Milady says, I don't think there's anything in the pleading, is there? So perhaps we should turn to it. Then it, it, exactly. So you have it there. It's in the core bundle behind tab seven. And what you get is a narrative style of, of pleading in terms of the um, page one through eight, the summary. And at paragraph 16 is where... Well, can we, can we just have a quick look at paragraph four? Contractual and common law duty to take reasonable care and the pleadings add to obtain the best reasonably obtainable price. I think you, you mentioned somewhere that you don't see the basis for the judge, judge's reference to that, but there are references to it in the pleading. But, but it's, it's, it's more about the, mm. I say that, my lady, in relation to the, the evidence. Right. But that's the, pli the, the contractual and common law duty was both to take reasonable care and to obtain the best reasonably obtainable price. That's it, your pleaded case. It is, but, but that, that is on the basis that you must give advice and do things with that aim. That, that, that's the overall aim to do that. But on the way, you have duties to ensure that is effective. Well, that's, there's a, there is a distinction. You, you may say it may be a distinction without a difference, but there's a difference, it seems to me, between 
if you like, a contractual duty that you will report back after the cleaning process, come what may, and a duty of care which might or might not, on the, on the facts, require some further discussion. Milady, yes, but the, the two morph into each other, as I think your, um, your, your reasons uh, reflect, where you say it's also an aspect of ground one. Because when you're looking solely, for a moment, at the, the reasonable care negligence um, side of things, you still have to have regard to the mandate. You still have to regard as to the basis upon which um, the painting was consigned. So, so they aren't uh, in two silos. In fact, quite the reverse. So, so when we say, you, when you're looking at the duty of so-called disclosure under Thompson, you're not starting with a blank sheet of paper. You're, of course. You, you're putting in, well, what was the contractual obligation to, to assess uh, and research, point one. And point two, the other thing that's not a blank sheet of paper is you've already been told that this is probably a Chardin. So when you're looking at the scope of the duty to disclose anything, simply under the negligence side of things, you have to bear those points in mind. The duty to disclose, you have to take colour from those facts. And perhaps that is why uh, the bright line distinction that my ground one seeks to uh, uh, create w wasn't um, at the forefront of people's minds. Because it, it is, in many ways, a distinction without, without a difference for the points, the reason my lady says. Because you need to consider it. The, the contractual duty, the basis of the consignment, when deciding the scope of the duty of care yeah. in relation to it. But no one, it's, as far as I can see, no one was saying at trial, or at least certainly in the pleadings, you always said you would come back to us. Uh, you know, you, you should have come back to us because you were contractually, the terms on which we sent you the painting required you to come back to us before sale. That's not what the pleadings say, well, and Milady, I don't think it's the way the case was put. Well, Milady, when you look at the judgment, the judge was, was very much aware in the, in the points I've taken, and others I will take you to, that the, of the primacy of the contractual duty, I, the basis upon which it was consigned. And that's why he said, well, they've been, um, they're, they're a matter of history and I can't uh, um, know what they are anymore. So he was in no doubt upon which the way it was being run, is that the contractual duty, the basis of the consignment was important. Well, can you show us that in the pleading? Well, my lady, in the pleading, it doesn't, it doesn't get... Um, no, well, it's just not there, is it? The primacy of the case in the pleading was a breach of the duty of care and negligence. Well, 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 let, well let's go to so paragraph 16 I was going to take you to when my lady took me back to yes, paragraph oh, 4. Paragraph 16 is... Uh, the bit where it's pleaded the defendants um, actually on the recommendation to the defendants uh, sent the painting to the defendants premises in London for cleaning and research the painting was not sent to the defendant for the purpose of the sale and neither the trustees nor Lord Williams asked the defendant to arrange a sale okay I, I understand that but we I, I just want to point out that we do need to read that with other references in the particulars to obtaining the best reasonably uh, uh, obtainable price. That's both in paragraph four, it's also on page 146. I forget which paragraph, it's part of a long paragraph with particulars. Um, 3.1. I don't, I think you've got to address the point that there's, I can see, I don't know if my ladies can see, any, any reference to you failed in your contractual duty come back to us before you sold the painting. Well, Milady, you, you have to take these references to the best reasonable attainable price to, it's dealing here with the sale to a dealer. That's what that's getting at, is you shouldn't have done that and had a sweetheart deal between yourself and another dealer. Um, yeah. So, so you, you have to read that in context. It, it, was, it, was, it was never the case. Uh, at trial, that um, 
by the claimant that the mandate was just to uh, get the best reasonable price. In fact, the, the base of the consignment found by the judge in, in, in a number of places is to assess and clean. And the point then was, well, uh, okay, and it's one of my latest points, well, the, authorized, the sale was authorised, well, yes. Um, and the reason that was important is because that hadn't been the mandate. The mandate had been, and we can see it in, in the documents in the case, was to take these paintings, research them, assess them, with a view to possible sale. That's in the letter. So for the sale thing to happen, to be authorised, there needed to be a, a further step. And the further step was to, to, to tell Lord Weems, well, we've got this price, it's a good price, and, and, and Lord Weems acquiesced and approved that. But that wasn't part of the mandate. I mean, if, so if, the, the judge was wrong to say that the mandate was simply to obtain the best reasonably obtainable price, indeed. in light of all the evidence. Indeed, and, he, and in, in a number of places he, 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 he in fact doesn't um, say that. Well, he says it at the beginning of 106, doesn't he? He does, he does. indeed. And, and nobody suggested that the, that the mandate had been reduced to writing. Correct. And no evidence was expressly directed at these points you now say were part of the mandate. Um, well, well, I think they were, Melinda. If you look at paragraph 107. Yeah. Mr. Onsay based much of his argument on this point on the undisputed fact that the paint was originally sent to Dickinson for cleaning and review. He argued that there was necessarily been an obligation on Dickinson to report back on the painting once cleaned to give Lord Williams an opportunity to decide whether to sell it or not. So, so, so that is a, an imprint of my ground one. It was raised, it was argued, and, 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 and that was based on the, if you go to paragraph 29 of the judgment, that reflects the mandate found by the judge at paragraph 29. Following a meeting, Dickinson wrote a letter um, that a group of nine paintings, including the painting, should come to London to Dickinson's gallery to be cleaned and assessed for possible sale. Simon Dickinson wrote a letter to the Williams identifying the relevant pictures in that letter, and he says of the painting, Rosebud claims your picture has been in England since 1751, etc. Uh, probably painted by Chardin, but very difficult to tell in its present state. But where was it pleaded that he failed to fulfil the terms of the mandate? There, well, are, there is a pleaded case that he failed to exercise reasonable care and skill. But where is it pleaded that he failed to fulfil the terms of the mandate? Well, my lady, it's not specifically pleaded well, and in, <laughs> in, in those terms. No. If, if you go to paragraph 22 of the pleading, of the pleading, yeah. Performing the service described above, you owed a duty to exercise reasonable skill and care arising both in tort by reason of the defence assumption of responsibility and in contract. Yes. But that's the closest that's you get. get. That's the closest you get. Calendar. It yes. is. Uh, and then you get. Uh, in 24, in breach of, of the duties, plural, so the contractual and yeah. the tortious duty, the particulars are then set out. Negligent in. I indeed. Yeah. So but, there, nowhere does it say he did not fulfil the, the terms of the mandate expressly or impliedly. Malay, no, he doesn't, not in those terms. No. But, it, but if you go to um, the, the particulars, all, all the for instance, if you go to page 147, the particulars under sub uh, three, sorry, sub four. Yeah, so the particulars are in power 24 and they're numbered Roman numeral one through to four. If you go to four, yeah. this is in essence, this is the particular of breach that 
I particularly rely upon here, defendant to warn the trustees of the risks involved in the course of action it intended to take, so the trustees decide whether to take these risks or not. And this is the aspect on which the judge dealt with the counterfactual? Indeed. So it's not as if the point wasn't raised, but it wasn't raised distinctly and separately in the pleading. It's well, covered. It's unsurprising that the judge dealt with it in the way he did, in circumstances where there was no pleaded case that uh, Dickinson failed to to fulfil the terms of the mandate. Well, Radar, I'm not sure that's fair, because he does okay. recall, doesn't he, in, in the judgment, in the paragraph I've, I've referred you to, at uh, paragraph um, 107, where he said, Minister, based much of his argument on this point. So, so it's not as if this point wasn't raised and run. Well, on this point in the context of negligence. Well, my lady, it, in my submission, doesn't much matter mm. for, for these purposes, the context in which it was raised. It was said there had been a breach of duty in not to doing certain things. It was part of the case that it was consigned to research and clean. So these are the building blocks. It's true the pleading, in retrospect, you know, could have been worded differently to, to if you like, separate out rather than have a um, sort of omnibus pleading in this way of the facts and the duties. But you ask the question, was this per point raised in the pleading? Yes, it is, generally. Was it raised uh, at trial? Yes, it was in the evidence and in the submissions. And was it dealt with the judge in the judgment? Yes, it was. But in my submission, uh, n not terribly well. But you need to deal with the respondent's point that if this had been raised as an issue in the pleadings, we'd have ra we'd have might well have uh, put forward different evidence. You've you've got the point. It was clearly argued, but uh, certainly the written closing submissions seemed to raise it in a, as an aspect of the duty of care. And the respondent is saying, if we'd understood that you were saying this was part of the contractual mandate, then we could have led different evidence or more evidence. No, well, well the, I mean, every, uh, every contract is obviously different. It depends on its terms. Yeah. Um, and the fact that other paintings were sold previously, three or four, is in my submission neither here nor there in circumstances where none of those had, at the time of the mandate, a, uh, an uncertain uh, antecedents. The thing about this case is, at the time the mandate itself was uh, entered into, the, the, the letter that, 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 that um, was sent actually referred to the fact of the, um, if one goes to the supplemental bundle behind tab six to remind yourself of that letter, of the 5th of March. I'm sorry, that's su supplemental bundle? It's, it's right. tab six, page 16. Thank please. you. In no other case was there a letter like this in these terms. Good idea, following pictures come to London for further research and possible cleaning. Very difficult to judge them in their dirty state. And over the page, it talks about the Chardin. Uh, Rosenberg claimed your picture's been in England since 1751, described it as being a reworked copy. My feeling is this painting was probably painted by Chardin, but it's very difficult to tell in its present dirty state. You take those two things together, those two sentences, and at the time of the mandate, it was clear that the antecedents of this painting, its background, uh, was uncertain, and um, Dickinson wanted for it to be cleaned and to be researched. And to some extent, the same was true in relation to the Botticelli that was sold before, and in relation to which attribution was uncertain. And Mr. Dickinson uh, secured a full attribution. And that, the, that course of dealings starting then and going on to the other paintings that were dealt with before the Chardin, would have been explored. Well, because none of these, uh, it was never said that any of these mandates were reduced to writing. 
And so it would have been relevant to look at the course of dealing with But, my lady, th this mandate has been reduced. Th this is in writing. This is the mandate. This is the, the source of the obligation. Well, where's that pleaded? Well, my lady, my lady, it isn't. But it wasn't disputed. Well, it wasn't disputed that that was the letter that started the process. But nowhere was it pleaded that that was the contract. Indeed, the findings of the judge were that nobody could really remember the terms and the contract hadn't been reduced to writing, or if it had been, it was lost. But, but my lady, so that... So to now say that that's the contract, well, it no, changes the position altogether. My lady, I'm not sure that's entirely fair, because well, what the judge said was that this really was the contract, it was the mandate, but, but there had been further conversations between Lord Weems in particular, uh, which neither of them could remember. That's the position. And if you look at the... Uh, the judgment. Can you remind me where he says that? That that was really the mandate? I thought the only thing we had was back to paragraph 106. Yes. This mandate from them was simply to obtain the best price reasonably obtainable for the paintings uh, given well, to him for that purpose. And 79, the precise details of the duties should be governed by the terms of a contract. The terms are forever lost in time and can only be inferred from the evidence. Lady, yes, and that's the point I, I took you to earlier. But, but the judge has already found, based on the letter I've just shown you, uh, that that letter, unsurprisingly, identified the terms in which the painting was, um, w was consigned. Paragraph 29. But that, even that doesn't get you there, does it? Yeah. I mean, you can clean and assess for a possible sale and then do something which both parties agree was authorised, which was actually sell. There's nowhere spelt out that there has to be, if you like, a break between the two when you regroup and have a further discussion. Well, maybe you that's... need to read that in, don't you? you well, well, you do to an extent. I mean, you have to say, if there's a mandate to clean and assess with a view to possible sale, and you do that in the circumstances where at the time of the mandate, as I've shown you, the authenticity was in doubt, mm. it is impossible to fulfil the mandate to advise and do those things with a view to possible sale without reporting back to the person who decides whether to sell, to sell or not. So you could say it takes an extra step, but it's implicit within the, the possible sale in the circumstances of, of the written mandate. Can you read that both ways? Because you could say it's implicit from what happened, namely that an authorised sale took place, that that further discussion was not required. Yeah. Milady, I don't think so. I don't think you can say from what happened that therefore you imply there wasn't a duty to do well, something yeah. that I mean, it, didn't it's, happen. It's, it's possibly beside the point because the fact that we're still dealing with the issue that the contract appears not to have been pleaded in a way. No, no but, but we're talking here, remember, simply about ground one. Yes. The, 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 the I, same points yeah. arise on grounds two to six, well, where clearly it was an issue and it is an essential part of the duty that was dealt with of reasonable care. And it wasn't dealt with, I say, for the same reasons, um, properly or analysed properly in that context either. So, But Mr Cavanagh, what we've got, uh, as I understand it, just so that we are where we are and we may have to uh, move on from that because we can't make uh, any more of it, we have paragraphs 29, um, 79 and 106 of the judgment, which is the way that the judge dealt with the contract, uh, the retainer, let's call it that in sort of more neutral terms. And it's at uh, 29, it's to be cleaned and assessed for possible sale. That's why they come to London. The paintings come to London on that basis. And 79 is, uh, uh, the contract itself seems to be lost and we can only infer it from what happened, and so the judge deals with what happened, the evidence before him. The evidence before him 
is framed as a result of the particulars of claim and the way they are, uh, are phrased, which don't refer directly to a particular contract for a particular retainer, uh, but talk generally about uh, duties and how they arise. And, I, and you've taken us to those references, albeit they're, they're relatively brief, to contract as well as negligence, and we've seen those paragraphs. And the judge then decides at, at, at uh, um, 106 that the mandate was simply to get the best price and he formed particular views then on the basis of the evidence which was before him and had been uh, sculpted, put it that way, on the basis of the pleading which does not have anywhere expressly this was what was contractually agreed. Um, and I think that what we were just debating back and forth about whether um, in fact the judge uh, in your ground one should have writ the uh, contract large or larger and what uh, is being said to you because we are concerned about it is that he took the, the route he did uh, because of the way that the matter was pleaded and he was inferring from the evidence before him and that evidence as I say was sculpted on the basis of the POCs I don't think we can, unless you've got more to say about that, we can progress that further. Is that fair or am I um, short-circuiting? No, I think that's a fair summary, but you also have to look at paragraph 108, I think, that follows the 107, yes. um, where Mr. Onzo based much of his argument paragraph you've looked at. Oh, 107, do you mean? Or 108? 107 we've looked at. Yeah. It, okay. It's in 108. Where he says it's clear there's nothing in the evidential record I don't have any decision point between the dispatch of the painting uh, to the, and its sale. But he does say that he infers, and it was agreed that the sale was authorised, but he infers that Lord Weems must have known. Well, he known it was going to be sale, yes. sold, but it comes back to another of my, uh, my Lord Justice Fawkes points, is, well, what was authorised? What was authorised? What Lord Weems knew and been told that this was probably a Chardin? He authorised that painting to be sold as a Chardin at a price appropriate for that. That's what he authorised. There's no evidence he knew, no findings, he knew anything else. Okay. But again, that wasn't the way the case was put. No, it wasn't. My lady, I think, I think it was. Because my lady friend cross-examined endlessly on about, well, Lord Wins, come on, you must have known it wasn't being sold as, as a Chardin because of various references and various invoices and such like. And he said no. And my lady friend cross-examined about, well, surely... You could have done the internet search, you could have done other things. He yeah. said, well, that, that's not okay, what I did. But there's no, there, are there, there are no findings of fact about that at all, there? About, about which element? That, that, um, those combo, those, uh, that bit of evidence given by um, well, the witness. Well, th there's no... It, it just, presumably we have what we have at 108. And 32 on this point, the question of attribution at this stage was uncertain. No, but that... And it was described as attributed to uh, Pierre Chardin and in the draft sale note described as Chardin and Studio. Exactly. That was the evidence that was cross-examined on. I don't think the judge actually makes a finding. Um, but well, these but... are his findings, aren't no, they? No, 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 no. It makes a finding on the point, M my lady... Lady Justice Falk mentions to me. Um, so certainly, um, there's no finding that Lord Williams authorised the sale of this as a copy or as a, fud a fudge price or any of those things. He was never told any of that. Okay. There's uh, no finding either way. There's no finding as to what he authorised the sale of, other than he well, authorised Well, we have 108, as I just referred you yes. to, is there's no evidence at all that Lord Weems was disabused of what he had been told, not just in the letter I showed you a moment ago about probably Chardin, but earlier documents as well, that it wasn't in fact a Chardin. So when you ask the question, and, and there's one document that says, by the way, 
were close to a sale on this for the Chardin, and it's going to be sold. Lord Williams, understandably, thought it was being sold as a Chardin at a price for a Chardin. Test it in this way. If it was going to be a copy, a copy isn't worth 1.1 1 .1 right. million. I think the judge made findings about those emails using the Chardin reference as a convenient label to identify the painting. But, Milady, this is a different point. You're, 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 you're turning this into a, um, a finding which I can't see in the judgment at the moment. I don't think expressly... Um, I'll be correct, I don't think expressly mm. makes a finding as to Lord Williams' state of knowledge. But he certainly doesn't, my learned friend certainly cross-examined on it, on the basis that, come on, you must have known. And there's no finding that, that he did. Um, and if you look at, the, the witnesses, the judge accepted the evidence that Williams is being honest, etc. Paragraph 52 in this connection perhaps is relevant, dealing with the Weems evidence. No record of discussions between the Weems and Dickinson's. Last, it's entirely clear, no point did Mr. Dickinson suggest to the Weems there was a chance the painting might be worth considerably more than the price at which he recommended it be sold. Now, that, that, that's a finding that is pregnant with the, the point I'm making, is that at uh, no point was he told that this um, is being sold at a discount to the real Chardin price, and it's being sold at a fudge price. And that is the, the, the gravamen of, of the complaint, that you have, you have a painting here, which at the outset was consigned when its authenticity was in issue. Uh, the, the, the dealer, Mr. Dickinson, says, well, it's probably a Chardin. And then nothing more is said. It's consigned to basic research and for a possible sale. No time does uh, Mr. Dickinson come back and say, well, I've had it cleaned. Uh, it's possibly the real thing, but you'd have to go to Rosenberg to, um, to do that. The upside is four or five million. Uh, the chances of that are these, for these reasons. He could, on the other hand, say uh, that the copy Rue Touche um, reference in the, in the book meant something else. But, but none of this happened. The question is, did Mr. Dixon, in the situation here, have a duty to do any of those things, whether in okay. contract or in talk? Well, maybe we should move on yes. mm -hmm. uh, to, to that duty of aspects of the duty of care, the duty. And the counterfactual. Because there's, do you, do you accept that if the, um, If these points go nowhere because even had the advice been given, the, risk, the outcome would have been the same, then there can be no real point in pursuing these grounds of appeal. Uh, but if, if under ground one and or grounds two to six, the advice would reach the same result, then, then yes, that, that, yes, that must be so. Yes. But, but, but I say two things, but well, so you understand our position. One is that if the proper advice had been given, then they wouldn't have agreed to this sale as fudge price. They would have gone to Rosenberg. And there's a lot of a chance in relation to that as to what he would have said or done. So you need to deal with what the judge's findings were on the counterfactual, because he made findings that they wouldn't, that they would have. Well, well again, he doesn't deal with causation separately. He, he deals with it in one place as an aspect, aspect of of, of duty. If you look at the judgment and its structure, he deals with obviously duty, etc., and, and and breach, 130, summary and negligence at 137, and then goes straight into damages. If there's no uh, above paragraph 138, there's a missing section that should say causation. Now, the only time he deals with 
uh, this issue at all? Can we say on the basis of, 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 of no evidence? Is paragraph 106, when dealing with duty, 106 is under heading, was Ms. Dixon's decision to consult negligent? So when dealing with duty, there's a throwaway line in the middle of 106, or two throwaway lines, where he says, um, Lord Weems made the entirely sensible point that Mr. Dixon told, if it, Mr. Dixon told him there were steps which could be taken which would improve the likely selling price of the painting by seven million pounds, he would of course have urged those steps to be taken. It's a bit I rely upon. Then he says this, however, it seems to me equally clear that if Mr. Dixon had informed him there was an accompanying risk that the one million sale price would be significantly negatively affected. He would explain to Mr. Dickinson, probably somewhat brusquely, the judgment, the making judgment calls at this time is exactly what Mr. Dickinson would be paid to do. That's the nearest, that's the only thing he ever says about causation in the context of duty. Yes, but our, he nonetheless has made some findings at 106. Are you saying he wasn't entitled to make those? Yes, I am. I'm saying there's no evidence at all for that second finding. And if you go to the, and I'll take you to the evidence where the so-called counterfactual was uh, put. So you're saying there's no basis for, and I'm in 106, which, which line? Uh, the, the equally clear, however it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Is he not entitled to draw an inference from the evidence he's heard? He's heard the witnesses. He's formed views about the course of dealings. Well, 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 I'll take you to the evidence and, okay. and, and you, you can look at that. But, but basically, both Lady Weems and Lord Weems were asked about this, but in a very odd way and not really given the full benefit of the counterfactual. And their evidence was, I'll summarise, I'll take you to it, that um, they would um, have been inclined to go and see Rosenberg, they'd have held out for the higher price. But unfortunately, the way the counterfactual was put was not put fully, and particularly the upside was not um, was not um, described. So the evidence on causation, if we go to uh, the witness statement first of, of Lady Weems, so that's supplementary tab 10. Power 14, uh, the last line. In particular, I would not agree to sell the Chardin for the time Simon had not told us that he had got a good price for it, or if I had thought that it would have been possible to obtain a better price for it. Isn't this a very dangerous uh, exercise, Mr. Cavender? I mean, the judge ha had this evidence, he heard the witnesses being cross examined. And uh, he came to conclusions in relation to fact. It's very dangerous of us for us to go back and cherry pick through witness statements, isn't it? No, I'm just giving you the starting point. I'm going to take you to the cross examination now. Okay. Because I, I say it's clear. If we then go to supplemental bundle number two. I mean, in a sense, um, the end of fourteen states the obvious. Yes, possibly. I show it to you simply so you. Yeah. Um, so if you go supplementary bundle, tab two, uh, page 55. Internal page 55, or page 55. It must be internal. Yes, indeed. Um, this is where, page 55 is where. Yeah. The cross examination uh, star. Yes, so we're on bundle page 75. Yeah. Indeed. Oh. There is. And we go to page 57. You can see at the bottom of, of, of there, and you know we're encouraged to accept the price because it was a very good price and it might disappear, and, we're all, and we were happy to do that, but we weren't mm -hmm. really given the option of what were the other choices. In retrospect, think there were other choices. For instance, take a photograph of the painting once it had been cleaned, and we thought it looked a very, 
I mean, I slept in a room for many years where we went to gossip, and actually, I thought it was rather etc. Yeah. Um, and Above then, that, at the start of that section, she starts by saying, well, we had for many years completely trusted that they were looking after our interests. In, indeed. So, so that's as far as that goes. And then um, the counterfactuals put at 74, page 74, internal 74, my friend's asking about you take advice from Dickinson. Um, and my little friend, I have seen the picture cleaned. I don't think there's anything particularly. It, this the sound effect, counterfactual my little friend was putting was this. Imagine this scenario. This is 74, line 9. Mm -hmm. Seen the picture cleaned. I don't think there's anything particularly new which has been disclosed by the clean. Take it to Rosenberg. Mr. Rosenberg, you may downgrade the picture, in which case it'd be worth only £10,000. I did not think you'll upgrade the picture. To ask you that question, I would suggest to you. You'd have said, no, don't take it to Rosenberg. I'm not sure. I mean, there are other experts, as my husband said. I think Mr. Bailey's one of them. He's from New York, who is considered, etc. Can I ask you? And she says, it was it was taken amazingly quickly, turned in roots of sale, sold to a friend of a friend very quickly, never invited to look at it, which was normal. We weren't sent a photograph of it. Later, we went and saw the clean, and she showed us professional photographs. It would look beautiful, actually. So there have been other ways to sell, to sell it. Then my friend tries again. What I want at the top of uh, 75, what I want to focus on, uh, what you'd have done at the time. Could you read the first sentence? Uh, 74. Yeah. 74, line 25. I'm not going to suggest to you, Lady oh, Weems. Just going to suggest. I'm just going to suggest to you, Lady Weems, that that's what you now know about the case. What I want to focus on is what you'd have done at the time. What I'm going to suggest to you is that Mr. Dickinson said to you, seeing the picture cleaned, I don't think there's a lot that's been added by the clean. Take to Rosenberg, he may downgrade it and it would end up with the picture being worth £10,000, you'd have said, don't take it to Rosenberg. Possibly, I can't tell you. I might have said, let's try some other options first. And then on the same theme, page 80, line 19, because I mean, it might have been worth a gamble that it looked like a masterpiece after the first cleaning of Sarah Warden. It might have been worth having a photograph taken and showing one or two people, in my opinion. And then on page 81 at the top, line five, yes, but he could have also done what he did with the Pusim, which was to go to these two people he knew well and say, I wonder if one of your clients would be interested in it as on the verge of being a Chardin. So in my submission, the counterfactual was never really asked in a proper way because it never put the upside. The proper counterfactual is that this painting uh, has aspects of Chardin in, but it I feel troubled about marketing it as an autograph Chardin. If it is an autograph Chardin, it's worth five or six million. If it's not, um, uh, then it'd be worth very much less. We could go to Rosenberg and he could he could he could um, endorse it, in which case it'd be sold at six seven million. Uh, alternatively, he, he could say copy Rue Touche means what I said it means in my book. So so the but that was obviously underlying the, the that. The counterfactual that was being presented. Everybody knew that had it been uh, Chardin only and autographed, it would have been worth more. But, Milady, but not, not by how much, because when you're asking the question, as I say in my, my skeleton argument, it was all upside here. There was no risk in going to Rosenberg. Why? Well, um, uh, no, that's a, contrary to yes. the findings, factual findings of the judge. You need to challenge that. He, he, he finds, does he not? That there was a downside risk. No, he does, and he's wrong to do so. But and I do challenge okay, that. Okay, you're challenging his factual finding. But, but because, uh, well, 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 why do I say so? Because on, on his other findings, he holds that um, Dickinson himself thought that the aspects of this painting were by Chardin. Yeah. He, he finds that. Um, the Brazier and the... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And he finds that the capital letter in bold mm. in the catalogue means that he's seen the painting and it is of Chardin. He, he takes that view, but he, he was, al it was also found at trial that he was correct in his recollection that Rosenberg had told him something about Holy Studio. I forget the 
precise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, 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 but bear in mind, that had happened before this had been cleaned. And it was, it was hanging in a dark room. So things had moved on. That was a very long time ago. And so surely uh, the clients were entitled to be told that of the upside as well as the potential downside and of the likelihood of the upside occurring. They weren't told any of this. And this all hangs uh, on your, in relation to your first ground of appeal, in relation to... Uh, the retainer, the contract, and we've explored that, yes. I think, in full. Um, but I just want to be clear that you are uh, challenging uh, the findings of fact, which we find at 106, and also um, that there was a downside in going to Monsieur Rosenberg. And uh, I just want to, to uh, that that's what you said, and I've, I've noted that. Where do I find that in the Grounds of appeal. Am I? I'm sorry not to have. Um... I'm not sure I had picked that up. From no. The, um, no, it, it is not all in all. there. Um, grounds of appeal are in the core bundle behind tab one. Um, it's uh, ground C of ground three. If you look at C, the last line of C, there was in reality no such risk, and the judge should have so held. Well, that's different from the points yeah. you're now making. That's a different point. Well, that's the, the, this goes. This is a causation point. But it doesn't even refer to one o six. That refers to paragraph 121 and to 103. But what you are doing is making a head-on attack on findings of fact made by the judge in light of the evidence he heard and read on what, in 106. Where, where is that in your notice of appeal? Well, it's certainly in my submission covered by... Um, it's, all, it's about the risk. What... What um, 106 is dealing with, although it's not mentioned in, the, in, in that particular ground, is the risk of going to uh, Dickinson. So, sorry, going to Rosenberg. I'm, I'm sorry, I know it's in 106. I thought it was somewhere. Oh, it's in 103 as well, isn't it? Um, that's. I was just trying to find the judge's finding. I think 103, risk of the roulette wheel reference. So although, although 106 isn't referenced in that paragraph, my lady, the, the point is, and the point is, what was, what was there a real risk in going to see Rosenberg? No, no there wasn't. And then in D, I go on to say, even if there was such a risk of approaching Rosenberg as identified by the judge, and you could say, in parenthesis, say, including paragraph 106, it's an important one, and it should therefore have been disclosed to the claimants who need them how to proceed. The situation had been explained to the claims, they would have insisted that the painting be referred to Rosenberg in its clean state for uh, his view. Sorry, where are you reading from now? From uh, the paragraphs in, in C, my lady, okay. paragraph 19 and 20. Right. But the point is, it, it is taken in the, uh, in the grounds. Can, can I continue what I was doing, which is looking at the evidence uh, and the points put to to the witness and go to what Lord Weems said in, in relation to this. So we're back in um, supplemental bundle to tab two. And it's internal page 44. 43, line 20. Can I ask you just one question, my friend asked, if Simon Dickinson had said to you in August 14, look at this picture. I, I'm sorry, can you give me the reference again? Tab two. Tab two of um, yes. supplemental two, yes. internal page in the transcript 43. Thank you. So my friend's putting a question, look, this picture isn't accepted by Rosenberg and I can sell it for one million now. 
if it were accepted by Rosenberg, I might be able to get much more for it. You wouldn't have waited, would you, for Rosenberg to die? If I was offered the larger sum later, I've gone for that. And then the question goes on. Um, uh, or, or waiting for Rosenberg to change his mind, having seen the clean picture. If you answer my question, please, Lord Williams, would you be willing to wait for Mr. Rosenberg to die? I'd be willing to wait quite a long time for a much larger sum. Even if it were unlikely, even if there was some doubt as to whether it be accepted, if it was a possibility and it was a very large sum, which it seemingly was, then I'd be happy to wait. And then further question, then at line 22, I've heard of another independent expert, Colin Bailey in New York, seems to be very the second most important expert in the world, so he could have sent it to him. So that is the only evidence. That's the only time this point was put to either of the witnesses that could speak to it. And that is the evidence. Uh, that, or I ask the question, how, how can the judge on that evidence <coughs> say so it's equally clear that Mr Dickens had informed them that there was an accompanying risk uh, he would have explained possibly briskly that that was a matter for him to decide but what in my submission that evidence shows is that the witnesses who were believed and were found to be reliable were saying if they'd been advised non negligently and in accordance with the mandate they would uh, have sent the painting to Rosenberg. What then happened uh, with Rosenberg is a loss of the chance. But to say uh, 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 that, that this case can't go ahead at this stage because it was plain the result would be the same even if they had been advised or warned. In my submission, that's the only evidence on the point. Uh, and uh, in my submission, that's not sufficient evidence, anywhere near, but for a finding. And, and what the judge is doing is, is just um, inferring, but not, in, not based in evidence. And that is, in my submission, impermissible. You, you can't just, because you've seen someone, you say you believe them, and they're telling you one thing, and then you make a finding completely contrary to that, and say, well, in effect, I think they'd have done the same. We need, need now to move on and make some more progress with your grounds of appeal. Milady, yes. The um, grounds two to, to, two to six, more generally, we say a dealer in Mr. Dickinson's position acting competently would have advised the clients of his concerns about authenticity uh, following the cleaning and, and tell them he thought parts were authentic Chardin, but he wasn't sure about all of it and that therefore he was uncomfortable at marketing it as a, as a um, holy autograph Chardin. But he should have advised the client of their options, which would have been to show the painting to Rosenberg and ask him to confirm his view, to show the painting to some other expert, such as Bailey, to ask him for his view, referred to at paragraph 38 of the judgment, uh, to, to, to sell the painting on the open market as a Chardin, for a, for the description of its antecedents, or to do what in fact he did, which was the possibility of selling it to a dealer at a fudge price, which is what in fact happened. My learned friend's case is, and must be, that he didn't have to do any of the earlier things. He could just, of his own volition, sell it at a fudged price without warning or advising the clients of anything. The possibility of it could be worth much more and the possibility of doing something to uh, obtain that higher price. That's what my learned friend's case must be, that uh, there was no duty to do any of this. And as I say, the option of showing Rosenberg was all upside. When previously asked about other works, it always said, uh, read my book. Look at the judgment, page 75. So the chances are, so, so, so the, chance, the downside of him saying, well, no, this is holy copy. That's the risk here, remember. The, 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 that's the my learned friend's case. Um, in circumstances where his book had the painting down as one, two, one, 
capital B, bold B, I shan't at and had been seen. See paragraph 9. In circumstances where Mr Dickinson, who uh, the judge accepted, did have a good eye, his own view was that this was at least partly Chardin, see judgment power 43. That's also confirmed by the finding of the judge at power 17, where he said there's no dispute that at least some parts of the painting are by the hand of Chardin, and that fact is recognised by Rosenberg. You go to paragraph 17 to remind yourself where he says that. Five lines down at paragraph 17. Against that background and that evidence, the idea that Rosenberg would have simply said, it's just a copy, just a copy, was no more than a remote possibility. Indeed, we know when asked, he said, he would need to see the clean painting, I emphasise they hadn't seen the clean painting, alongside those in the Louvre. See paragraph uh, 75 of the judgment, if we can turn that up. So 75D, bottom. And if you look at 75A to D and remind yourself, th those are the responses he in fact gave. So in A, it says, I've not changed anything, the notes of the latest edition of my catalogue. In B, he talks about his, his, uh, his review is in print already. Let's summarise 77. Uh, Monsieur Rosenberg uh, says what he said is in the catalogue, and uh, he wasn't going to uh, change his view unless he'd seen it. Exactly. So, 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 and he hadn't seen it cleaned. Yes. This is the important point. So it wasn't as if you were saying, oh, can you change your, or, or give us some more, a different view on the same thing. No. There'd been a passage of time and it'd been cleaned. So, so the idea that the reason, uh, the, or the, the non negligent advice would have been, well, it's too risky. You know, he, he, he might say it's just a copy is, in my submission, not sustainable against that body of evidence. And certainly not sufficiently to say, well, it was so clear there's no duty to uh, warn the client or give them that view. And remember, the reaction of the restorer was the cleaning had revealed a beautiful painting Yes. Judgment, paragraph 93E. A beautiful painting doesn't necessarily mean it's by Sean. No, 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 it doesn't, which is a good joke and, and true. But, 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 but what it shows you is that it was a different thing, that, that there was more to see there. And the expert eye of Rosenberg may well have picked up. Or well, at least there's a loss of chance. That's where the loss of chance comes in. I think we've got that. Milady, yes. Now, um, so to be clear, it's our case that the, um, it was negligent to advise the seller of 1.15 million in circumstances where there existed ways in which the attribution and price could potentially very easily have increased fourfold, fourfold without any real risk. And that case was supported by the claimant's expert evidence. See judgment, paragraph 109, Mr. Miss Kaminsky. Now, against those, um, against that evidence, the findings of the judge were a paragraph 48 vis-a-vis -vis the Weems, is that they uh, were both transparently honest witnesses and did not differ from each other in any material um, way. He found at power 52 that at no point did Mr Dickinson suggest there was a chance the painting might be worth considerably more than the price which he recommended be sold. And at power 101, 
when dealing with the duty to consult, the judge looks at that <coughs> in a subjective way. He looks at Mr Dickinson's beliefs as opposed to the views of an expert in the position of Mr Dickinson, which seriously, in my submission, invalidates his assessment. And it's a mistake. Sorry, can you just repeat that point? Paragraph 101, dealing yes. with the duty decision not to consult Mr. Rosenberg. Yes. The, the judge applies a subjective test. He says, I think it's clear that if Mr. Dickinson had believed there was a serious prospect of persuading M. Rosenberg that the of the painting could be improved, he should have done it. And he's talking about what he believed, if he believed the likely outcome. At no point is he depersonalizing the test and saying objectively, uh, an expert in the position of Mr. Uh, Dickinson and what he would have done. And it's not a slip of the pen, as you see in the grounds of appeal, ground 2B. There's about eight or nine instances where the judge does this. In fact, nowhere in this judgment does the judge ever purport to apply an objective test. say is that the non-negligent advice would have been to inform of the conflict on provenance, inform of the, the effect this would have on price, not that it just have an effect, but the, the degree of that. Instead of 1.1 million, you're talking about 5, 6, 7 million. That, that, that was um, n never done. And in answer to a lady justice, my lady justice uh, similar, that you said, oh, come on, he must know it's worth more. Sure. But, but how much more? you're going to advise someone uh, and, uh, and get them to make a decision whether to sell, then you, then you do have a duty to say, well, orders of magnitude at least, before asking you to decide, well, you know, shall we take this so-called risk of, of, of sent to Rosenberg? And if you say, well, there's five or six million in it, and the risk is actually, there is one, but it's pretty small, it's clear from the evidence of Lord Weems and Lady Weems that they'd have said, of course, send it to Rosenberg. So that's the, the non-negligent advice that uh, should have been given and wasn't. This, the, the, and this is the case where there's not a, any doubt about that, that this advice was given on the judge's findings. So nothing at all was, no advice was given. Look at paragraph 108. It's clear nothing in the opening record identifies any decision between point point between the dispatch of the painting and its sale. Now that is in my sense it's extraordinary when the mandate or consignment, call it what you will, was to uh, research and clean with a view to possible sale. Not to come back at all with anything. Despite the fact at the time of that mandate, the uh, the provenance was expressly being questioned, although it was probably a shardown. That, that is the gravamen of this case and of this permission to uh, appeal. And you, I you think also have to back, back, I'm so sorry, you, what do you? 109, um, where the judge says he didn't think it negligent for a dealer who'd been given authority to proceed on the basis of his own discretion to do so without further reference to the principle. Milady, that reflects the earlier findings. Exactly. What, yes. what, what was, you know, what, what's the basis for that finding? Well, where's the evidence in the judgment or in, in, in the cross examiner anywhere for that finding? That, that the, you had essentially a mandate to take this painting and sell it for the best possible price. That, that, full stop. That, that, that's the net effect of that finding. Yes, now, consistently well, with his earlier findings. Exactly, but but it's not consistent, my lady, because he recognises that the the terms on which the painting was uh, consigned are crucial, but he has trouble establishing them. But he has found that there is a written uh, document that constitutes the mandate that's wholly inconsistent with a general discretion to sell at best price. 
Well, we've been over that. We have, yeah. But, and it, it was me, my fault for raising it. Sorry. Milady, no, no, it's good, it's good to go around and make sure that <laughs> your relationship has, has, has the points. And I think we do have the points, and we have the, the central uh, basis of all of the grounds, I think. Um, you started off, obviously, with ground one and the, uh, the retainer, the contractual point. But I think the other grounds, uh, two to six, all have this resonance, which is what you've been uh, concentrating on. And we've got the points about what you say about the judge's findings, which you say he shouldn't have, couldn't make, and uh, his subjective rather than objective approach. And then ground seven, uh, latches on uh, to those grounds. Is there anything else that we ought to be um, taking into account? Because I think we've got that general picture. Um, there, there, there's another point my learned friend says in response to my, well, this is all subjective. Is, mm -hmm. he, he says that's unfair because there was one element uh, of Mr. Dickinson's subjective belief that was an issue, namely uh, what he thought by reason of the earlier meeting at Gosford House. But that was the only element of, 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 of his um, subjective belief. Um, and, and so, yes, it wouldn't be surprising to find a finding about that. But that doesn't invalidate the general point, which is that when implying the test in Thompson, um, it's clearly an objective test. Uh, and uh, and coming back, the final point I think is I, I, I've got quite a lot of pushback on the pleading in relation to ground one. Um, whatever the answer to that, the point was squarely raised, and it was certainly squarely raised in the context of the, uh, the reasonable duty under grounds two to six. And the very same points arise there, the very same point. Uh, where the pleading point can't, in my submission, be taken against me, because of course it, it falls out of the duty of reasonable care, and the judge makes findings on that basis. I mean, well, what's interesting about this application for permission to appeal is when the judge saw it, um, he didn't on ground one say, well, it wasn't argued like this, or this is all new. Well, what he said was, is well, you know, that the, the there, there was very little evidence of what the mandate was beyond beyond the letters. And, and that's not a bad test when you're um, asking yourself, well, is it unfair for a point to be raised on appeal? Is the trial judge didn't sort of say, well, hang on, I've just heard this case, and you, why wasn't that raised? It doesn't say that or anything like it, which is perhaps also a, um, a, uh, a point to be, to be borne in mind. So, um, Malays, unless there's anything else, those are my submissions. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lake, we received your uh, very helpful submissions, and we're grateful that you are here uh, to assist the court. Um, uh, there is, uh, uh, well, uh, there is in particular, I think, one point which would help me, which is, uh, what you have to say about Mr. Cavender's submissions that there is no evidence to support a number of the uh, findings made by the judge. Well, Melody, I wasn't clear that that was one of the points that the friend was making because they aren't on the grounds of appeal. And so I'm not really prepared to deal with that point. But, Melody, what I would say in relation to the point about putting the counterfactuals, mm -hmm. um, the point that my learned friend, the, the sentence that my learned friend didn't refer to was what I was saying, was that you're just saying you, the witness, are just saying what you you now understand to be the case. So, mm -hmm. so the fact that the judge found that these were honest witnesses who were saying what they were saying now with hindsight Indeed, doesn't maybe. mean he wasn't entitled to draw an inference from all of the evidence that in fact what would have happened was they would have accepted Mr Dickinson's it, it, advice. It, it, indeed, Melinda. And, you, and on this point about accepting Mr Dickinson's advice, as I said in my submissions, that was conceded by Mr Onslow. It was conceded by Mr. Ronzo, and the reality is he had to concede it because he didn't have, unusually for these cases, um, he didn't have a, ve a, ver a viable counterfactual on the basis of the facts as found by the judge. The, the reality was, Maloney, 
um, and one can see this from Mr. Onzo's closing submissions. But bear in mind, I've, um, Mr. Onzo and I have been against each other on many occasions in these type of cases. And Mr. Edwards, that drafted it, um, has also been. I mean, we do a lot of these cases. So he, he, this is not. Um, it's not his first rodeo when I say that. Really. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, Mr. Onslow, um, he, he put the case squarely on the basis of this point about copyright touche. And he didn't put the basis, as I did in Thwaites, the case on the basis that there was something that Dickinson should have seen in the painting. And in the circumstances, he, he, he wasn't able to say, forgive me, Lady Lambert, he, he wasn't able to say that there was the, the advice that Dickinson would have given in the counterfactual would have been different from the advice that Dickinson would have given had he been asked to give it. And it's very clear from the judge's findings that the advice that the Dickinson would have given would have been, don't go to Rosenberg. And I can Sorry, expand um, on that in a little more detail. Can you just remind me exactly what the concession was that you preferred? Well, lady, it's, it's in my submission. Yes, um, I just want to remind myself. Exactly and you'll find it. it. At, you'll find it's at paragraph 30 on page 13. Mm -hmm. 30 A. Okay. Next one, I'm going to charge on, my lord. But this, this was in closing. This is in, in reply yeah. in closing. And, and what happened, my lady, is that um, there was a point raised in the, this might be boring detail, which the ladyships aren't interested in. But um, the, the point was is that Vilma Ramsey, who was one of the trustees and therefore one of the decision makers, didn't give evidence. Yes. And so it's obviously very difficult to set up a counterfactual in mm. circumstances where one of the decision makers isn't giving evidence. So mm. our closing submission said you should be drawing inferences from the fact that Laura Ramsey didn't give evidence. In um, the submissions that were made by uh, Mr. Onslow, in, in sort of in response to that, were well, of course, um, if they were given non negligent advice. Um, if the trustees or Lord Williams had been given non negligent advice, they would have followed it. And Milady, it's very clear um, from the tenor of the evidence and the way that it's pleaded, and the fact that Mr. Ro Mr. Dickinson had made a fortune for the Williams in relation to the previous sales of these pictures. There's over £25 million pounds worth of pictures were sold. Um, it's very clear that they would have followed his advice. So, and that's I mean, when in the essence, was you're made. saying there's a concession that they would have followed his advice. Indeed. And his advice, his advice actually would have been not negligent. I, indeed, my lady. And, and that's where my learned friend is now attacking the, the, attacking the question of applying to Rosenberg. That's why he has to attack it. Um, it, it, it I, if, if you'd like me to, my lady, I have some points, ladies, I have some points that I could make in relation to that, or you, you, you might not find it helpful. No, no, please do. Um, if I could make some, um, obviously I was there, but <laughs> so I, <laughs> I've lived this case. Um, the, the, one of the points your ladyships should um, should um, pay attention to, if I make my submission, is um, this point about de la main de Chardin. Now, really, what the case was about was the gr the spectrum of possible attributions mm. and the. The way that Rosenberg, and this is in paragraph 10 of the judgment, but if I can just explain it, it may be quicker. The way that Rosenberg approaches the question of attribution is using the phrase de la main de Chardin. Mm -hmm. And de la main de Chardin includes both downright masterpieces, like the first Louvre version. And little and, pictures. And little pictures, and also studio copies. Mm -hmm. And um, the so Jean, even even though they're not, <laughs> even though they're not this. de la main de Chardin, Rosenberg yeah. still includes them. Okay. And and if, the judge, if they're his studio. Well, it, it's more yeah. complex than that. Okay. Right? It, All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <this> <laughs> and and your ladyship will see that in paragraphs nine to fourteen. No bright line between wholly mm. autograph and partially. Autograph.
and I'll, I'll, I'll let you ladies just read it. Similarly, the point to take from that is that if you have a de la main de Chardin attribution for your piece, that does not mean it's going to be very valuable. So there's a huge spectrum of possible values attached to that attribution. So all the way from the Stone Cold Masterpieces to um, a good studio copy. And in that context, the frame, the, the, um, the acceptance by the judge that Rosenberg had told him, had told Mr. Dickinson that he thought the painting was Holy Studio at Gosford was very important because the painting could have been, um, could, could, once, once Rosenberg had published that view, that would have seriously affected the value of the painting. And that's the point that the judge is getting at. Now, as to uh, and sorry, and Mr. Cavender is saying once it's cleaned, uh, it was obvious it sh it, uh, they should have had another shot. Well, well, two points about that. Firstly, um, this this idea that the painting wasn't seen appropriately at Gosford House is was not part of the case that was run by the claimants in the end. There were lots of, as, as you often get in these cases, there were lots of sort of dirt, dank pictures of back bedrooms. In fact, they're rather well done up in this in the Gosford, but uh, dank pictures of back bedrooms and arguments about how light it was. But it turned out that the picture gallery, which was a purpose-built picture gallery by Lord Weems's ancestors, was just across the corridor. And the critical point was, is that after Pierre Rosenberg had seen the picture, and there was no question that he had seen the picture, he upgraded the status of the picture as seen in the catalogue resume. So by definition, this was our argument, which, um, which is why the point wasn't really progressed. By definition, he must have seen it in a good enough light to make that change. Because Pierre Rosenberg is not a, he's not a cowboy, he's performed by Head of the Louvre. So, and, and as to the point about the effects of the cleaning, um, it was accepted by Ms. Kaminsky, and uh, forgive me, this is a new point to me, so I don't have the documents in front of me, available to me. It was accepted by, by Ms. Kaminsky that Mr. Dickinson would have been able to gauge whether the painting needed to be shown to Rosenberg after the clean. And that was a critical part of our case. And if he'd seen something particular that made him think, well, this must be... Chardin Indeed. himself. Uh, uh, through all the painting, my lady. And, and Mr. Dickinson's evidence, and Mr. Dickinson spent a lot of time in the witness box. Um, uh, Mr. Dickinson's evidence was that he, uh, and you'll see, you'll see it in the judgment, he, he went to the, he went to, the, he looked at the picture, he thought there were some good bits in it. He saw that he looked at the picture in the Louvre, um, and he came to the conclusion that this was just not of the same quality, and that the bad bits in his view, continued to be bad, even after he'd seen the picture in the Louvre. 
and there was this argument about, well, you, you should have taken transparency, and the judge said that Mr. Dickinson, like a grandmaster, would be able to, which if you've met Mr. Dickinson, you could well believe, I have to say, but um, uh, that, that's not a submit, that's a, that, that's not maybe something I should be saying, really, but um, uh, let me put it this way, I think his record speaks for itself in terms of um, his ability to, um, or his, his, his capacity as an I, what's called an I in the art world. Similarly, those are, the, those are the points in relation to Rosenberg, and, and that was the thrust, that was the context in which the judge came to the conclusion that he did in relation to showing Rosenberg the picture. Um, I, in relation to the subjective, objective beliefs, if you, if you, if you would like me to address you on that, I, I deal with it in a little bit of detail in my submissions, and I really don't have a lot a lot more to add on that. Well, uh, thank you then. I think we'll go on the basis of your written submissions. Thank you, Melody. I mean, the, in relation to this question as to um, the role, uh, in relation to this, if I can put it this way, Melody, um, Melody Friends needs to show that the advice that Dickinson would have given would have been negligent in order to get home on his counterfactual. Proposition one. Proposition two, Mr. Dickinson's views in relation to um, the attribution of the painting were critical in assessing what his advice should be, should have been. The, the claimants made a challenge to Mr. Dickinson's evidence, saying that actually he really did think it was a proper shadow, a fully autographed shadow, and they lost on that. And that was a subjective element. That, that, that has to be a subjective element. Be. You'll see, but, but maybe yeah. I do have Thompson at first instance in court if it would be of interest to you, but um, I've, I've set out the relevant paragraphs of the, of the relevant cases in the schedule to my submissions. And so all that was left for my learned friends, all that was left for the claimants, was to argue that there was something objectively flawed in Mr. Dickinson's um, attribution of the painting. And all they had left were the paragraph 93 documents, which in practice um, we're never going to get them anywhere. Because they didn't engage with Mr. Dickinson's assessment of the painting independently of those documents. And if it would, if it would assist you ladies, ladies, I could take you through the paragraph 93 documents, or we'll take you to paragraph 93 and and make some comments on it if that would help you. Um, but there are there are in my in my written submissions. They're in the written submissions, so I think we'll be um, I'm grateful, maybe. happy with that. Yeah. Yes, thank I'm, you. I'm grateful. Um, the, there is the point in the, Lady Justice Felt made this point about um, the way that the judge deals with the counterfactual. Um, so if I can, uh, this is paragraph one five eight. I don't know if this, this continues to concern you, Lady Justice. This is 152, forgive me. It's at page 120 of tab 5. Yes, it's just the way he says it's not impossible. Um, if, Milady, if I could just get, put the context of, of that um, observation. Um, it, he says, in the case before me, the question which I have to answer is to whether, on the assumption that the painting is not in fact visibly inferior to the other versions, ah, okay. Mr. Rosenberg, upon seeing it, would have been prepared to go beyond his usual see my book response. And um, if, your Lord, if your ladyship refers to paragraph 138, you'll see the context in which the judge is dealing with this point. Now, what he should have said is um, uh, this counterfactual is only relevant if Mr. Dickinson's view as to attribution is wrong, as opposed to whether or not he should have given advice, which is the substance of the different advice, the substance of the of the, of the of the attack now. But it's pretty clear that that's what he meant from two things. Firstly, can I take you to paragraph 117? And this is the, in the context of should Dickinson have marketed the painting as Chardin rather than Chardin's studio? 
And if your ladyship had it, um, this is about five lines down. I think that Mr. Dickinson, who did not accept that Mr. D does your ladyship, your ladyship yes. have it? Yes. Mr. Dickinson, who did not accept that Mr. Rosenberg had a significantly better eye than his own, <laughs> was convinced that if the painting was submitted to a three way comparison at the Louvre with the other two versions, Mr. Rosenberg would have concluded that it was inferior to both and it had significantly more studio input than either. And if, if your ladyships um, go back to what, Madonna, what, uh, forgive me, to what um, the learned judge says at paragraph 142, he's saying, on the assumption that the painting is not in fact visibly inferior to the other versions. So what, what the judge is saying at 152 is if, if Mr. Dickinson's view as to what would happen in the, um, there's a particular French phrase for it, which, forgive, forgive me, eludes me for the moment, in the confrontation, in the, <laughs> if, if there were a particular, if, if Mr. Dickinson's view as to what would have happened in the confrontation was negligently wrong, <laughs> then this is the scenario that would have arisen. And for what it's worth, my ladies, um, I can take it, it, the, the judge in the, the judge in the permission to appeal hearing specifically makes this clear, if it would help your ladyship. Can you can. just point, give us the reference? The reference is, it's um, supplemental, supplemental bundle one, tab 19, page 167F2A, the following page. Where he says hypothetical based on the facts. It's, so this is this is internal pay, internal numbering thirteen. Yes. Um, bundle numbering, and at the bottom of the page, my lady he says, Mr. Lake, that's me. It's not really general principles. There are some unfair points made by my learned friend of the ground appeal. I'm not going to deal with them in any great detail. Your lordship will have spotted them yourself. But the two I would refer you to, particularly take your lordship to ground three two, where my learned friend compares. Your Lordship will see my learned friend refers to paragraph 152. Yes, which was a hypothetical based on different facts. Thank you. Mr. Lake, it was a hypothetical exactly. Judge Gleeson, yes, at the name of the page. On the assumption, my Lord, that the case was so clear that Mr. Dickinson was negligent in failing to appreciate the painting was by Shada. So that is a bad comparison. Thank you. And, and the judge then says, yes, yes. So, Malou, that's, that's in relation to paragraph 152. Um, there were further points raised in relation to different ways of approaching Rosenberg, which L Lady Justice Fowler referred to in her, in her order. Whatever one might call reason. Mm. Whatever one call. I, I can deal with those of you that she would wish me to, or you may just feel that they're not. Um, I, I think that uh, we don't need that. Thank I'm, you very I'm much, Mr. Lair. I'm grateful. Unless I can assist you, Lady any further. Thank you very much indeed. May I just refer to one point? This occurs to me, uh, my little friend, showing the decision on application leave to appeal, core five. It's paragraph eight when he's dealing with the second pillar, the terms of the contract. Paragraph eight, the judge says this. As to the second one of those pillars, the key to this case is. Sorry, of no, where, where, where are, are you reading from? This is paragraph eight of the document, my little friend, decision on application for leave to appeal, core tab five. I, think I don't think it's core. Core, core tab six. six. Oh, sorry, I'm obliged. Oh. <laughs> I'm like I've taken mine out, obviously. Um, it's paragraph eight of that document. It goes to the point I said about the judge, his reaction wasn't to uh, say, well, this wasn't uh, argued like this. Paragraph eight, as to the second of Mr. Onslow's pillars, the key to this case is, of course, the terms of the contract between the claimant and the defendant. So he, he very much had that in mind. So the suggestion this is the, the new point and he didn't, didn't uh, have regard to it, it doesn't really... Um, fit, fit with that either. He's saying there, uh, as he says in the judgment, uh, that it's it uh, varied from time to time and it's got to be inferred from conduct. It, indeed, and but but the thing about that is obviously it is in writing. I'm not going to go through this again. You've seen the documents, and he accepts that. The difficulty with inferring from conduct something that hasn't been done is deeply problematic. From conduct, you can say what what was agreed, 
by conduct, but where you're saying something should have happened but didn't, like a warning or advice, yeah. then the fact that it wasn't given doesn't say anything about whether well, that conduct yes. is supportive or not. Of course, I can see that point as an aspect of the duty of care, but you're addressing here the contract point, which I think we've sort of fully yes. covered. But it goes to both in a way, because the judge is saying here the contract is not just the, the letter and the consignment, it's other things. But he doesn't identify what those are, yeah. is my point. But you, you have those points, and there's no, there's no point in reaching them. Thank you. Unless I can assist you, those are my submissions. We say there's a realistic prospect of success, and the mission should be granted. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to both of you for your assistance. We're going to rise for a few moments now. Uh, please don't go away. All right. Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And the, 
professional. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. And I don't particularly do all kinds of martial arts. Quite, mm. <laughs> if it's, if it's, if it's not, in a funny kind of way, I think. Mm. What I'm going against it, like, which is that you have to be professional. Yeah, yeah no, no, that, yeah, that's professional. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, no, that is. Exactly. It's one of those things where you just kind of awake at night and you really want to do it. Yeah. Um, and you feel it's so real. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I so don't do much. Unfortunately, I train for it. Oh, I know. It's much easier. No, no, exactly. But for good reason, are you presumably doing it? To do your your bank bashing? Did you? Was there this case in Singapore? I don't know. Maybe there was. Mm. But I, I remember trust it was a right. um, um, It's a case where Credit Suisse was being held liable for not enough dealing with authority because the relationship manager in the economics was Georgian oligarchs. And in the end, uh, and it was just it was just the most extreme kind of um, a sort of litany. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the worst is if it's the wrong length of gap. Yeah, if it's a day or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think we put something. Two. What did we have? And I think it was three days. Did we have three days gap? Between, between elements. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you just lose your That's the wrong amount. Yeah. Well, it's a fair case of the sun. One of the helpful things about it is that he spoke. Um, he, he's very clever. He speaks. Um, he speaks. You know the judge. He, he speaks French, Italian, and German, and most of the evidence was in French. Um, so it was quite helpful. The written evidence was just a bit. Well, all, all, all the, yeah, I mean, all the academic stuff was in French as well. So the British one, which makes it so much quicker. In fact, the only person that didn't speak French and Italian was the training secretary.
Thank you very much indeed for your very uh, careful and helpful submissions and for Mr. Legg's uh, additional uh, written submissions. Um, we've decided, in fact, that uh, permission to appeal should be refused on all grounds and written reasons uh, to that effect uh, will be produced and circulated in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you.